Hello and welcome to the Study Legal English podcast. I'm your host Louise and today I'm really pleased to be joined by Tim Wood who runs the Old Bailey Insight and Legal London Tours which is a tour company which provides tours around the Royal Courts of Justice, the Old Bailey, which is the Central Criminal Court, and the Inns of Court, which is where the barristers work. Another reason why uh, Tim's on the show is because he's also a court reporter or has lots of experience as a court reporter reporting on crime and has lots of uh, experience in that sector. So really, really interesting. Really pleased to have Tim on the show. So thanks for coming, Tim. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you, thank you. So, first of all, Tim, can you tell me what is a court reporter? What did you, what did you do as a court reporter? As a court reporter, I, well, I covered criminal cases in the main. I mainly worked at the Old Bailey. I was there for well over 20 years covering cases for national newspapers, radio and uh, TV. My job was basically to go into court, to listen to a case, take down notes and then provide a concise story for my customers, which I've just told you who they were. And why did you become a court reporter? I started off working for the Enfield Gazette, which was my local newspaper in North London where I was brought up. And then I went on and sort of got what I thought was my dream job, which was working as a sports reporter in a a sports agency just based off Fleet Street. Uh, But I hated that because I like playing football. And of course, I was having to cover football matches and stuff, and I never got to play myself. So... I gave that up and thought, what did I enjoy doing when I was working for the local paper? And I really enjoyed covering magistrates' court, and there was a job going, and I went and uh, became a uh, court reporter based at the Old Bailey. What was it like working at the Old Bailey? Well, when I first started, in about, um, it was about 82, I sort of first went in there. Uh, It was a very exciting place to work. It was full of reporters. There would be, uh, usually on any given day, at least 20 reporters working the 18 courts, which included agencies and reporters coming down from national newspapers. Um, There was a lot of competition, uh, and it 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 was good fun. And... It was short hours. You used to have to work very hard for a short period of time. Um, There was a lot of uh, drinking in the pubs, mixing with the lawyers and the policemen. Um, It was a very nice job, and I I thoroughly enjoyed it. Your court court reporting was for for newspapers, um, so to distinguish it from... um, Because there's another type of court reporter that, like, types out the transcripts of the cases. So yours was doing the, like, the media side of it. Yeah, mine was all media. The Evening Standard was the hardest customer to work for because they wanted it immediately. So you... Basically, you sat in court, were listening, and you started writing the sort of the first paragraph, which is called the intro. Uh And then you'd come whiz out of court, get straight on the telephone, and then do it sort of verbatim. Well, not verbatim, but you'd you'd be highlighting the interesting bits in your notebook during the case, and then you'd just do it straight from your notebook on the telephone to the evening standard. And then you'd go off and write it... um, for the, your other customers. Uh-huh. Did the other court reporter job, was that ever attractive for you? or, did, or no, you know, I, no, I would have found that incredibly boring because uh-huh. all you do is sit in one case for you know however long the case lasts. You have to take every uh, word down. And the job I was doing, I was flitting between courts doing the more interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, so your work was probably a bit more exciting, fast-paced... Some of the cases maybe go on for a long time. If you're doing the, writing the transcripts, it, it could, could be a bit boring. When you began to work, presumably the profession was a bit different to nowadays. How has it changed over the years? It was very different. For instance, when I first started, we were still using typewriters and uh, sort of black copies. So what used to happen is I'd come down, quickly type out the story and have about eight blacks and there were 
you know, about four or five people in the office and we all used to sort of read the stories over to the newspapers over the phone. Um, of course, then computers came in and what a blessing that was when you could copy and paste and, you know, just send it straight over and no more having to ring up what were called the copy takers at the newspaper and, and dictate the story. So for me, the computer was... A wonderful uh, advance. Yeah. Uh, so eventually, you actually set up the Old Bailey Insight Legal London Tour Company. Why did you do that? What pushed you towards that? Well, I was sitting in the Old Bailey one day, listening to a very interesting case, and I I was in the press bench, and I looked up into the public gallery, and there was not a soul in there, and I thought people would like to listen to this, so. The first thing I set up was purely just the Old Bailey. What, what I used to do was I used to prepare a list of the most interesting cases on at the day. I would give a talk about the uh, history of the court and, you know, various uh, anecdotal <laughs> information. Uh, and, and then I'd sort of set it up so uh, visitors could know where the public galleries are, know what the procedures were, because a lot of people are intimidated and they don't realise that the courts are open and as you know and justice has to be seen to be done i mean it's written as, as common law yeah i think because the legal profession especially in the uk it's seen as like this very traditional elitist not open for people you know there's the wearing of the wigs and the gowns and things like that and people are probably a bit put off and then yeah. it's inside these great grand buildings people aren't sure whether they can access them or not but yeah people can go in so that's great and so can you explain a little bit about what what you do as a tour company yeah, I mean, the, the main tour I do, do is a combined tour of both the Royal Courts of Justice and the Old Bailey, and, a, and also taking in one of the inns of court called Lincoln's Inn. And inns of court, if you don't know, are places where barristers have their offices or what they call their chambers, and they tend to be very grand affairs. They're, a lot of them, or the main four ones, are based on the great colleges of Oxford and Cambridge, and a lot of people are absolutely amazed when they walk in, you're sort of in a busy street, and suddenly you're in this serene sort of area with sort of grass and, you know, wonderful buildings, and, uh, you know, you're, you're less than three quarters of a mile away from Piccadilly Circus. So when I do the Royal Courts of Justice, I give a group a talk about the history of the court. I then talk about the legal profession, how it's changed. I mean, for instance, at the moment... There's a real push going on to bring big business from around the world to come to London to settle their commercial disputes. There's been a, a new block of courts called the Rolls Building that's been opened up. These are 28 super courts, which are part of the Royal Courts of Justice complex. It's turning many of our barristers into multi-millionaires because English justice system is a very easy sell. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people respect it so much so that the the new block of buildings is nicknamed the Court of Eastern Europe because it tends to be full of <coughs> iron curtain companies coming mm-hmm. here to uh, settle their disputes. And I mean, there was one running. I mean, to give you an example of how much money can be made, there was one over a year ago now involving Roman Abramovich, who's the Russian owner of Chelsea Football Club. And I'm told the barrister who represented him during a three-month trial was paid £5 million. Mm. And it's not uncommon for the barristers working in this type of arena to be on well over £2,000 an hour. Mm -hmm. And they're incredibly accommodating. I went into a case at the Rolls building involving two Russian companies, and they were hearing it using Russian law. They're not even using the English legal system. But this new block is state-of-the-art and it's proving very successful. It's making money for the government and there's a real push to bring this foreign business in. But it's upsetting a lot of English companies because they're saying, we have to wait ages to get our courts on them. You know, we're the taxpayers, we paid for these courts and it's full of foreign companies. Well, 
you know, all the barristers are earning a pretty penny. So yes, it's yeah. a double-edged sword in a way. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting that you mention about the cases, international cases, where they're heard in, in the jurisdiction of England and Wales, but the law that they're using is the Russian law, and that's because probably some of the listeners out there, they use in their contracts, they choose the jurisdiction of England and Wales to hear a dispute, but then actually the, the law governing the contract would be the, a, a different type of law. So what kind of people come on your tours? What sort of I get a lot, of, a lot of students ranging from um, GCSE, A-level, university students. I also get a lot of people from sort of societies, women's institutes, uh, U3A, which is University of the Third age which tends to be uh, older people and I get you know coach groups and I get quite a few tourists now as well you know a lot of people from abroad so a bit more detail about you mentioned that you go around the royal courts of justice you do some things around the old bailey and the inns of court can you explain any more yeah well first of all I I start off in the great hall at the royal courts of justice and I I give a brief history who the architect was when it was built I talk about lawyers who work there. Then we go upstairs and there's a legal costume exhibition and I talk about a couple of paintings and I explain, you know, why barristers wear wigs, what they're made of and give little anecdotes about that. Then I usually put a group into a criminal appeal. I choose criminal appeals because these are quite short. Usually they are last between half an hour and an hour. And when you go into one, it's... You know, most cases will last, you know, especially a big civil case, will last a couple of months. So you're getting a tiny snapshot and it can be very boring. Whereas in the uh, criminal appeals, you're getting something that's easy to grasp and it's all being done in a short period of time. So you, you get a much better understanding of the justice system because you're seeing most of the process in that, in a criminal appeal. After we then leave the uh, Royal Courts of Justice, and I take them to some rooms in the building which have got historical importance. We then go into Carey Street, which is sort of associated with bankruptcy because the London Bankruptcy Court always has stood at the end of the road there since the court was open. And I give a little story about how when I first started as a court reporter, you know, I wanted to be at the Old Bailey, but unfortunately I was stuck up here and how boring it was. Uh-huh. And, and I talk about how Carey Street got its association with bankruptcy. And then we go into Lincoln's Inn, and I sort of uh, give them a little potted history of Lincoln's Inn, take them around that, and then finally we end up at the Old Bailey, and I give a, a history of you know how the court first came into being, how it started as a prison in uh, William the Conqueror's time, and then Newgate Prison was built about 500 years later, and talk about with the horrors of being there and then go on to talk about the court and how ex- well, how executions took place outside and that's basically it. Also, I have an association with a, a pub which is opposite called the Viaduct Tavern and they've got some old cells from Newgate Prison and I do another tour which is just the Old Bailey which starts in the morning and I um, give a talk and then they can go down into the sort of cellar system of the prison and see these old prison cells and get some idea of how awful it was. Yeah. And also I provide everybody who attends one of my tours a list of the most interesting cases on that day. So because I've still got contacts in the court, I'm able to get um, a little crazy of the cases and this enables people to make an informed choice of what, what trial they would like to hear. And I'll give a little bit of background and people will often ask me, you know, what, what should I go into? And I'll sort of say, well, this is going to be interesting because the defendant's in the box and he's going to be cross-examined so you know that tends to be exciting you know. so that that's how it works mm. when you were working as a court reporter were there any uh, like really memorable cases that stuck with you there were yeah i mean there were many i mean obviously it was my job to be in the most interesting ones when i first started obviously when you first start and you're hearing these terrible things it really has an effect on you but as the years go by, it's a bit like watching the news on television. You don't get so involved, emotionally involved in the cases. But when, within, I think, about 12 months of starting working at the Old Bailey, a, re- a, a case came on, and it lives with me today because I found it so shocking. 
and it involved a little girl called Heidi Casida, who was aged two, and her mother met a new man and brought him into the home. She had about three other children, so it was four children and her, and he was an incredibly controlling man, came into the house, uh, and uh, he took a dislike to this little girl, and what he did was he locked her in a room in the house, uh, shut the door. It was a, f- a bare room, basically. Mm-hmm. And the family carried on living um, while this little girl just starved to death. And the mum was too frightened of the man to, uh, you know, to intervene and, and, and get, let the girl out. And, you know, listening to this case, and the thing that got me was when... They, uh, the pathological evidence when they were talking and they found bits of the little girl's nappy in her stomach where she tried to eat that to yeah. survive and I, I just found it just so terrible and then when the man went in to the witness box to try and defend himself he started crying in the witness box and I was so disgusted by this horrible beast yeah. who you know, had done this awful thing yeah. that really really did give me nightmares yeah. and it lives with me today yeah yeah God, really really awful you must have heard some some mm. some awful awful things did you like in those cases did you see that justice was being done yeah by and large i did just i mean i i became of the view and i suppose it's a bit of a jaundiced view but after a time I realised that most people who were appearing at the Old Bailey were guilty of something. They might not be guilty of the the main charge that they were on trial for, but usually they'd done something that uh, was illegal. And, you know, to give credit to the English justice system, a lot more people who are guilty get off than people who are not guilty go down because... As you know, the you know the, there's a very stiff test. You know, the juries are told time and time again, you have to be absolutely sure before you convict a man of a crime. If I remember from my criminal law days, it's like they have to be sure beyond reasonable doubt. Yes, that's right. uh, there's always this uh, this word of re- what's reasonableness in the English legal system, and uh, so yeah, a very strict strict test so and then back to speaking a little bit about the old bailey insight legal london tours Mm. what what do you like about it um well what i like is meeting people you know i have good interaction and i sort of try and give them an insider's view of the uh, legal system (laughs) that's what um and sort of open their eyes to what's going on i i have quite um, a jaundiced view of the law in that having worked in it for so long as a sort of an observer rather than a participant I do feel the way it's been set up, it's been set up for the rich, Mm, mm, mm. you know it's a toy for the rich and it's become an incredibly complicated game and it's not really about justice in the end, it's about knowing how to play the game and the best barristers are the people who who know all the rules and how to manipulate the rules. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of, you know, obviously you've got big business and they're paying some of these barristers well over £2,000 an hour and you're not paying out that money for nothing. Mm -hmm. You're paying it out because you know these people can manipulate the system in your Mm favour. And so, you know, a lot of what goes on in our courts is nothing to do with justice or whether it's right or wrong. It's to do with playing the game and having clever uh, players, it's a bit like having a top football team and if you've got the money you can have Ronaldo and Messi, the best footballers in the world Mm. scoring your goals and that's how our our system is set up not so much in the criminal system but again you know, if if a rich person gets trial he can pay for a top barrister rather than getting one on legal aid. Interesting that you say that because I think I read that the statue or the sculpture of Lady Justice on top of the Old Bailey, I think, normally Lady Justice is blindfolded yeah, yeah. And, uh, and she isn't which supposedly you know it's because her maidenly shape is enough to show that she's a, yeah. a pursuer of justice however I mean t- t- talking about this oh justice for the rich and justice for the poor 
the, the Lady Justice on top of the, is it the criminal court? Yeah, the central criminal court of the Old Bailey, yeah. And not being blindfolded. Well, that's, well, yeah, it's meant to show of... that if your statue's blind, it shows that she won't be prejudiced, like, against anyone, because she can't see who's before her. So, you know, if there's a rich man in fine clothes and a beggar, she'll, uh, she'll dispense justice equally, because she won't be able to distinguish between the two. So is there anything else you do other than the tours? Yes, we've um, just started doing uh, legal crime and punishment seminars. We had one this week which was very successful. What these are is um, I I had a top defence barrister come along to talk, along with uh, the former Chief Constable of Cambridgeshire and also someone who's fallen on the wrong side of the law. And this is a two-hour event which uh, includes a couple of glasses of wine And these people give a real insight into how the law works, how to get in the career path. The the barrister, for instance, was very interesting because she was a comprehensive schoolgirl who's now gone on to break into a profession which does tend to be very establishment-based. And she's now one of the sort of top... Um, murder defence specialists in the country Mm -hmm. and she was talking about you know the difficulty is making their way through it but and also the policeman was very interesting in that he was talking about um, drugs and and he has a very uh, controversial view in that he believes that all drugs should be legalised in the country so he gave a lot of interesting insights into why and how it would sort of cause the crime rate to fall dramatically, take it out of criminal hands and able to regulate drugs and, you know, less people would die of overdoses because the whole thing would be regular. And he says it's a complete folly allowing criminals to be in control of drug supply in this country. And, you know, and I would recommend it for anybody who is interested in the law crime buffs and also is thinking of having a career in the law. And uh, so do you have any of these seminars coming up? What would the next we one be? We are going to put one on in early February, about February 10th, 12th. I'm just organising the speakers as we speak now, and there'll be uh, a notice put up on the website within the next week. So if you go to the website, you'll be able to see who the speakers are and work out if they're going to interest you or not. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm sure they will. Brilliant, fantastic. Well, I'm going to go on one of the tours, which I'm very (laughs) looking forward to. And that brings us to the end of the interview. So thank you, Tim, for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. And it's been a delight meeting you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for those of you who are interested in the Old Bailey tours, you can go to the website, which is www.old-bailey.com for more information. And, uh, of course, for those of you who are listening, if you want to visit studylegalenglish.com, you can find more resources there. So thanks for listening and see you next time.